Hey, Stephen, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, everybody. My name is Glenn Gillis. I'm the CEO of Sea Monster. We're an animation and gaming company based in Cape Town, South Africa. And today I've got the extraordinary privilege of hosting a panel conversation with you um, and our two esteemed guests, Nicole and Stephen, who I'll introduce in a second. Uh, the theme for this panel is crossing boundaries. Um, how do we connect the real world to the digital world? How do games travel around the world? Do they? Don't they? How do we cross over from the pure entertainment games that so occupy our time and our minds and our lives? And how do we drive learning doing that? And of course, how do we find new commercial models and cross over from grant funding to commerciality? And then how do we scale this so that we can impact the world? So. Um, that's who I am. That's the topic for today. We'd love you to join in the conversation. We're happy to take comments and questions throughout. We'll have a dedicated Q&A session at the end. But it is my great privilege to also welcome uh, on stage with us today, Nicole, who is the new CEO of Lemonade Day. Uh, she's been with the organization for a couple of weeks now, so has got lots of new insights and perspectives to share on the world. Six. Uh, congratulations. Congratulations. And Stephen, I'm going to give you a chance to introduce yourselves, of course, but uh, Stephen is a legend in the serious gaming industry, has been at the forefront of uh, transitioning from Minecraft, from a pure entertainment to an educational play. So that, that's who we are. Um, and yeah, I'll kick things off right away. And thank you again for joining us. Looking forward to, to uh, sharing the, the more with you as we go. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know, Lemonade Day is the most American of all things. It's it's set up a stand at the end of your driveway, sell lemonade, make money, and off you go. Um, but the organization has been around for many years, and I'll ask Nicole to give us a little bit of the history of the organization, um, and then we can use that to frame a case study, share some insights, things that we've learned from that, and of course, from Stephen's unique perspective in this area. So Nicole, tell us all about Lemonade Day. Hi, well, thank you so much for the opportunity to share that with everybody. So even though I may be new to the organization, I'm definitely not new to the area in which we serve. And that is preparing our youth for life, preparing them for life through fun, proactive and experiential programs that are infused with life skills, with character building and entrepreneurship. And the foremost objective is to help our youth today become the business leaders of tomorrow and to help round out what they are learning in the academic world and prepare them through real life experiential efforts of how to take and bridge the academic world and bridge what they are learning in this very heavy, dense digital world that we live in through social media and how to bridge all of that to make sense in the real life. And coming from a family of entrepreneurs, I'm a first generation college graduate, and I've spent almost 20 years in the nonprofit space from health and human services to arts and culture and community development. So I think it connecting with an organization like Lemonade Day really helps bring all of that together in the way in which all of our worlds through tech innovation, through spiritual learning, through academics, through health and human services and social services, how we can really drive change and systemic change, which I think we all would agree that systemic change is the very thing that creates lasting change. And that's what we're all here to do together. Absolutely. And it's incredible to think that, you know, the organization has been around for 14 years, nonprofit based in Houston. Um, it's impacted over a million kids and it's done the difficult thing. And that is go street by street, community by community, rolling out this program um, and, and really impacting uh, lives in the way that you've described. What's incredible to think is that it, it's also been so well studied and validated that how the impact of Lemonade Day has this lifelong effect. And it's a six week program. I mean, it really is it that simple to really set kids up for a trajectory that is so different from the one that they would have faced otherwise. 
I think it's the way in which we use our programs. I think for some, it can be a six week program. For some, it's a year long process that they are doing together with their mentors. And that's the critical piece of, of our program is that there's this mentor piece of it that really deepens the experiential component of it. And, and you're right, we have served over a million children. I feel like I have inherited a 14 year feasibility study that has been backed by the Search Institute to have a evidence-based curriculum model that can be delivered to kids either through a printed workbook or through this new digital experience of ours is amazing. And I think where we need to really focus our energy is meeting communities where they're at. So for some of our communities, the six month program makes sense. For some, it may be longer. And I think that speaks to the flexibility of our program and the diversity of our program toolkit that we can help really meet communities where they are. And I think important to say, how did Seamonster come into the mix? Maybe full disclosure, of course, Seamonster built the digital companion app for Lemonade Day just recently. Um, and yeah, we were completely inspired by the work that the organization has done over the years. And of course, what it takes to scale this um, around the world and around um you know, used in different contexts. So um, I'm going to show a very quick trailer of uh, My Lemonade Day, which is the digital companion app, which empowers both the mentors and the kids on this journey. Um, it's available in two languages for now, uh, English and Spanish, but they plans to change the world with it. So let me quickly see if I can do this um, and just share the video. And I'm going to do that like this. And then you guys, How do yeah. kids make money? How do kids make money? Whoa! Whoa! What's happening? Hmm? You should become an entrepreneur! Use My Lemonade Day to start your business. It's designed to help you turn your goal into a plan. And if you work the plan to run your lemonade stand, you'll achieve results to reach your dreams. Cool. And yeah, that's in a nutshell what we built. Um, but Stephen, I'd like to bring you in at this point. You've, uh, as mentioned in the brief introduction, I'd love you to tell the audience a little bit more about your uh, your career. I was going to say check it career, but that would be setting you up to fail and I would never do that to you. But your esteemed career, all the accomplishments, but really just leading into this idea about entertainment and the crossover into learning. So yeah, Stephen, tell us a little sure. bit about your, your history, please. Hi, thanks, Glenn, and apologies about the mute. Um, you were probably getting feedback from my mic. Um, I uh, So my name is Stephen Reid. I am based in Scotland and originally an educator, have come through my career kind of on a, a self-determined path, if you like, to help educators embrace technology meaningfully and a lot earlier than, than perhaps the trend has been before. We're all aware, and I'm sure those who are watching are aware that um, schools can be 10, 12 years behind the trend, if you like, in, in, in technology, but we don't have to be. And, and it also doesn't have to be hugely expensive or, or, or a massive overhaul uh, to, to embrace those technologies. And so 20 years ago, when I sort of first came into this space, what I discovered whenever I tried to do something technological, and of course, 20 years ago, we were talking about podcasting with that audacity and some cheap microphones and some basic animation. It was, you know, there's not enough time, there's not enough money, the parents won't like this, it's not on the curriculum, you know, that kind of stuff. And, and I really felt that we were missing something back then. And, and so I geared my career very much to, to doing that, including leaving education and running my own, uh, my own company. And and significantly with that, I, I started to use games. I was a gamer myself and and use and, and I, you know, I used the original Command and Conquer Red Alert on the PlayStation One. And I used, you know, I personally learned about I learned more about ancient Egypt and ancient Greece from Tomb Raider and, and Lara Croft than I did in my school. So I started to think I could do this as a teacher. So I started to educate with games. And that's now taken me, you know, 20 years later, I am now looking at virtual reality, mixed reality, 3D printing, and games-based learning sits at the center of everything I've done. I've learned, I've used 140 games, well, just over 140 off-the-shelf games, everything from Little Big Planet, um, 
Uh, Red Dead Redemption, we've used, uh, of course, Minecraft, which sits at the heart, um, Universe Sandbox, you name it, we've used it. And to teach everything, and I think the significant thing that I, I want to talk to about the point about moving from entertainment into education is that we're not just talking about explicit education, the science, the maths and the, and the literacy, which, of course, is important. And I do that with a number of games, but also what I call teaching the tough stuff. So I've spent a huge, probably the last 12 to 14 years really focused on how can we use gaming technologies to teach children about race relations or gender equality or religious and moral celebration or anti-bullying or alcohol awareness if they have parental alcoholism, uh, domestic abuse. Um, that can, how, how do we talk to children about those difficult things that even adults don't know how to talk about. And games is one of the best ways in which we can do that. Um, and so here I find myself now um, working for Microsoft. I joined Microsoft last year, who um, eventually sort of came to me and said, why don't you do what you do for us? And so I'm leading their customer engagement around the world, which is great. That's really fantastic to hear. And, and thank you. You really have been a pioneer and, and certainly a personal inspiration to, to all of us at Sea Monster and I'm sure to many of our uh, viewers out there um, about just how we can cross over. And I, I think it's important to, to know that, you know, there's something here about we've always played games, we've always told stories for the same reasons. You know, whether it's to entertain, to inform, uh, to educate, and of course, for purely commercial reasons. I mean, that's kind of why we've we've told stories and 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 set up these interactions. Those things really have not changed forever, but but critically, technology has, um, and and so the how changes, but the why doesn't. And I think your your introduction there speaks perfectly to that point. I think it's also important that as we start to help people reimagine their own relationships, their own worldview, their own sense of purpose. Stories really are how we shape the world, how we understand the world. Um, and in uh, My Lemonade Day, we were it was really great to be able to bring Becky, that was the character that you saw in that short clip. Um, so she's got a, a cast of friends. And, and if you follow her through her journey, so in addition to the app, there are 15 times two minutes animated stories, really. And it's her Euro's journey uh, about how she is becoming empowered through the process of Lemonade Day. Um, Nicole, you've been on the battlefront of this journey for, for over a decade now. Why is it so important that, that we give these socio-emotional skills? Why is it important that we help craft this new story? And, and how, how do we do that? Oh, it is ever more important. The last 12 years I spent in the affordable housing and homeless space. And I saw firsthand what, what it takes to wrap services around an individual and a family to truly enact change in their life. And with Lemonade Day, I realized I wanted to be on the other side of the equation. I wanted to be a part of a different story in a kid's journey so that in this beautiful, lofty, real, uh, maybe utopia that I live in, through programs like Lemonade Day, we can really enact change so that maybe there are fewer people in our prison systems and our homeless systems in, in need of affordable housing because we have been able to get at our children at the right moment. There is a critical inflection point in a child's development that you have to introduce these ideas before it becomes too late. And it's not to negate or to take away from high school and college programs that do start introducing financial literacy, skills building, and ideas around building a business. But we know firsthand through the science that if you get at a kid at between third and fifth grade, you are setting them up for lifetime, lifetime success. And I would much rather be a part of, uh, of a story where we are a little bit more front loading on, on our children and really setting them up for that success. And, and that's why I love being able to shift from that affordable housing world over to, to Lemonade Day. I feel like I've been studying it for a very long time, but I know at the end we need to make these entrepreneurships and learning elements desirable. We need to meet kids where they are and instead, some kids may react and may interact well with printed workbooks, 
but we know with the heavy inundation of technology coming to our children, I would much rather our story be a part of that and Stephen's point, be a part of delivering a positive story and being a part of the social and the economic skills building that's really needed and to be delivered in a variety of ways. And we need to grow with the times, right? We need to grow with technology. Printed workbooks do not work for everybody. And that's why this innovation around this app is so incredibly critical. And we also need to realize we can't rely on our, on our schools to take care of all of this. We also can't rely on our families to do it, especially in our underserved communities when moms and dads more often, you've got a lot of single parent households are struggling to keep the lights on they are not going to be as focused about those kind of character skills building and soft skills to round out your education. And if our kids are being put in front of devices as their way of uh, being babysat or being taken care of is in front of a de device, I would rather our story be a, a, that positive story. And, and that's where I think through the app, it's, I see people like Becky and I start thinking about these beautiful ideas of cartoons in ways that we could really take this to another level to plant the seed with our kids. That's amazing. And I want to bring Stephen in on, on this point because we know that games, one of the defining characteristics of a game is that it is a voluntary activity. So to your point about meeting people where they already are, you know, in fact, I guess all entertainment is about choice um, to a greater or less extent, depending on your privilege. But but we know how powerful that idea is because it does put us in, you know, as designers and uh, as influencers in the space, we do want to be in other shoes. So we'll leave the empathy point for maybe later. But really, Stephen, where I was hoping to take the discussion is to say, you know, you come up against this all the time, no doubt, where it's the digital is the enemy. Look at how much my kids are spending time in, in Fortnite and Minecraft. And, and yet we're talking here about the intimate link that exists between digital and real. And in fact, is there, a, a, where does that barrier begin and start? How do we start to affect behavior change in the real world? And can games really do that? Yeah, there, there's so much in that in that whole um, question. Um, one of which I run a, a, an event um, as kind of a session that I aim at parents called Reframing Gaming. And it's all about helping parents to understand how and why games can be positive for their children. You know, whether it's, you do Candy Crush Saga on a mobile phone, or whether it's um, uh, you know Call of Duty or or Command and Conquer or whatever it is children choose to play, and of course there are games that are age uh, restricted. But let's let's be real about this: children are playing them, and nine times out of ten the parents go, "I didn't even know they had it." Um, you know, this is my experience, and I say, and so I say to them quite often, you know, let's take screen time for example. When when parents say to me. Ah, Screen time, it's a nightmare. All my children do is spend uh, time on screens. And I say to them, what are they doing on screen? And they go, I don't know, I'm in the, I'm in the kitchen, they're in the living room or they're up in their bedroom, I don't know. And I say to them, until we know, we can't balance quality versus quantity. My argument would be that five hours on Minecraft is infinitely better than five minutes of mindless TikTok. And so, I, so what we need to do is we need to start looking at the quality versus the quantity of that time. Um, and then within that, we start to find what is actually going on. So I'll give you a very brief example. Um, I got called into a, a situation with a family that I knew and a school that I was working with um, together because the oldest son who had some learning difficulties, specifically around his behavioural um, uh, um, management when he when he wasn't engaged and he was really struggling with languages French in, in fact and he didn't like French he didn't speak any French he mucked around he disrupted the classroom and the teacher was like I am done like I need this kid out of my class and um, I got called in as part of the intervention because uh, they wanted to know if there was ways that we could kind of help him out and he worked with me through his family anyway and it actually turned out that he spoke a little Japanese, a lot of Macedonian, and quite a bit of German. Uh, he, in fact, almost fluently was his German. And the reason for this was because his gaming friends on Discord 
were multicultural. They were all over the world. He was connected with Japanese kids. He was connecting with Macedonians. And he had four friends in particular that, could, that spoke those languages, Germans um, in particular. And so the, the problem wasn't the language. It wasn't that his real world desire to learn or apply those languages was at, was at fault. It was that French wasn't relevant. And so I think where we start looking at real world connections between what technology offers us and where the technology uh, and where the real world sort of technology and real world meet is relevant. What, is it relevant? Like if we want children to think about saving the whales, we have to make it relevant. It can't just be some big umbrella concept. Um, it ha you know, homelessness. If we want children to tackle, help tackle homelessness, it has to be relevant and localized and, and it has to apply to them. If we want to teach World War II history, find a way to make it relevant. Let's talk about their granddads or their grandmas. I mean, I learned recently that my grandma fixed holes in the world war, in the planes in the World War. They would come in, she'd run up on the planes, she'd fill the holes with polyfiller style, and then the, the pilots would take off again. I didn't know she did that for years. I was never taught it at school, of course, but it, but it wasn't even a thing. So that relevance is where technology can really make it, uh, make the bridge. It's just like children live inside this technology with so like we can't dismiss the power of their social groups and their and their and their social standing and their badging and their all the stuff that they love is in there and if we just go ah oh, you know i don't know he's in the bedroom doing his own stuff we're dismissing what is essentially a huge part and i think one other critical point and i'll stop is no, we're also, please get, carry the fascinating. Yeah, we're also let's 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 look at the white. Let's set a thousand mile high. Look at the bigger picture. We are in a state of transition between generations who did not grow up with an iPad and generations yeah. who who did and one day will. We just need to get through this transition. We just happen to be the people who are managing this transition on the you know give us 10 years 20 years certainly 50 years this won't even be a discussion technology is coming and it is integrating and it is going to be part of everybody's life we just happen to be sitting at a critical point of transition between generations and i think that's something also to keep in mind absolutely and and i'm going to try a little side story here one of the posters that we have up in the sea monster studio is a picture of a world war ii bomber coming back full of holes. Um, and, and I don't know if you have heard the story about uh, the engineer who looked at this and thought very long and hard about how you strengthen bombers against uh, night raids. And, and uh, uh, everyone was saying, of course, you know, well, there are holes everywhere and this is where you need to strengthen it. And his unique insight was, in fact, these were the planes that made it back. So you needed to think very carefully. If these were the ones that came back, you didn't need to strengthen them in the areas where the holes were. You needed to strengthen them in the areas where the holes were not because those were the ones that didn't come back. And I've loved that story because it's so non-obvious or obvious when you think about it. But it does, you know, in some weird way kind of think about like problem solving these skills that the kids are learning in these digital formats and then how are they bringing them back into the real world um and and nicole you've been the, again like you've had so many experiences seeing this firsthand uh, for me we know one of the most powerful definitions of of learning is not knowing something you, you know we've been obsessed with content for the, the definition we love is is being able to do something that you couldn't do before and it's just a subtle change and and maybe Stephen, to your point too it's about that fact that we're at the transition you know for for the last 500 years the font of all knowledge has been the teacher standing in front of the classroom now that role needs to be reinvented as the mentor the river guide standing the coach standing next to you helping you navigate through the sea of content that already exists out there so yeah nicole in all of your experiences working in uh, underprivileged communities how have you seen the, the sort of social emotional skills the practical learning elements come to life and being given expression ah uh, well 
Thank you. I'm glad you opened that. Stephen, first, I'm going to start. To, I would love to take him on meetings, every meeting I have with, with donors and investors, because I, it resonates deeply. And we, all, we saw it during COVID. The, the classroom learning was revolutionized. And we saw it take on different forms and some more impactful than others. And that's why it's so amazing to be aligned with an organization like Lemonade Day that's at this new inflection point because we're committed to making it sexy, to making it engaging for kids. And I love that that we've essentially borrowed from the entertainment industry and the kind of commercial model to deliver social impact efforts. And, and that's what I saw firsthand in, in my previous life, because you see the way kids change in the old school way of delivering programs through a YMCA instructor is not resonating with our children like it used to. And we have to be able to grow with it. We have to be able to evolve and be able to, again, meeting our kids where they are. And that's a part of that professional development, but the life development. And that's what's so important is that you need innovation around these community-based programs that make it possible for our children to rise up and to fall in love with themselves and to be known and to be named by people in their community. And that's participating in efforts like this and it, being able to root it in teaching of life skills and entrepreneurial skills and the things that link kids to the sense that I can be somebody. I can be my own agent. I can make things happen. I can be my own financial independent person and not have to rely on my mom and dad, especially a mom and dad are part of a toxic traumatic relationship. It helps kids re remove themselves from that traumatized situation. And instead of repeating what they are seeing with their parents in these underserved traumatized families, they're able to, Stephen's point, engage with a different community where they can change that trajectory and hopefully break the generational cycles and habits that they're seeing all by these positive development, life strengthening tools. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I, Go ahead, Stephen. Sorry, I'm sorry. If, I could, if I could just add to that as well. One of the things I think we are endlessly guilty of as adults and it's and it's funny because we all complain about it as educators we all know that we at some point we killed the playful child in us at some point someone took it away from us i often talk about how if i go outside right now and i start climbing a tree in my local park someone will phone the police they'll say yes. there's a man climbing a tree <laughs> but if a child does it Oh, look, it's clear. I want to climb trees. I want to skateboard. I want to own a BMX, but society tells me I shouldn't. And, and at some point we killed that. And, and then we wonder why when we get to school, you know, when we get our children kind of coming to leaving school at the end, we're like, oh, they just don't think for themselves. They just, you know, it's like trying to, trying to draw blood, you know, it's like, and actually that was our fault. And the other thing that comes with that is I think we are eternally guilty of underestimating children. We always think they need led. We always think they need taught. We always think they need told. You know, a child's instinct for their own safety, you know, it can be flawed at times, but generally children are, they're aware of, you know, they want to poke and prod and try and, and that's how we learn life. That's how we learn when one thing's cold and one thing's hot or one thing's water and one thing's solid. Um, and, and, and even beyond that, we want to, you know, we, we're such we intrinsically play and learn for ourselves and yet we from a, such a young age of five and six years old we take them almost like um the logical song by super tramp you know we take them into this logical structured world and we say to them enough of that nonsense now you're gonna now you're gonna follow this line and i think it's tragic that, that we then complain about it at the other side and go you haven't learned to think for yourself and i'll finish on a quote um from tathagata uh, buddhist theory um which is you know it's with our thoughts that we make the world not with our recall not with our ability to sit and listen but with our thoughts with our ability to think through and think of and think about things um, and I just think that we need to be better at that as adults in our education system. And I've actually heard a lot of people say, I can't wait to get back to normal. You know, I hope once COVID's over, let's get back to normal. And I'm like, no, 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 let's not go back to normal. <laughs>
Let's go forward, Stephen. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. There was nothing normal about that, you know, and nothing normal about runaway capitalism and uh, the devastating effect that it's having on the planet and, and on everything. So, yeah, I do hope that at least some good comes of it. But as you're speaking, you know, I, I think that even in our cities and towns, we've actually removed those places of play. Uh, it's it's if you look around you and and Nicole, I mean again, you you guys have been in the forefront in your previous job, you know, in Lemonade Day. One of the things we need to do as we roll out the program is create safe spaces for kids to run a lemonade stand. Are you kidding me? I mean, one of the things Lemonade Day has has had to do in the U.S. is go state by state by state having to change legislation about being able to sell things just off the side of, of the street. Because one of the unintended consequences of laws was that they made it illegal for kids to run a lemonade stand. I'm sure they never thought about that when that happened. But we've removed our places where kids can play. We certainly removed them where adults can play. But why then are we surprised even by the outcomes that we're that you're mentioning here that oh. and, and why are we surprised that games offer this incredible attractive space where where we can do what we've always done fail safely just stumble Absolutely. around mindlessly exploring i mean it's just it's crazy incredible you, you you've really touched on a point that i'm really quite passionate about in fact i have I have a, an extensive collection of photographs of no ball game signs or no skating signs or no BMXing signs or no parkour signs. Our cities are becoming child free spaces. And there are, there's actually reports now about cities like London uh, uh, where, first of all, economically families can't afford to live in them. And so as a result, we don't design for them. We, we think, well, children aren't going to be there anyway, so we don't design for them. And then because we didn't design for them, we put we have to put signs up when they arrive with their skateboards or we put little, London is full of, you can't sit anywhere in London without a spike or a metal ball or something to stop a skateboarder. And it's like, but we'll sell skateboards back to them. We're very good at taking what children do. We package it up, we stick it behind a brand, we pay wallet and we sell it back to them. Um, in the form of a brandy t-shirt or a brandy hat or a skateboard or a BMX or whatever. I mean, BMXs are like a thousand dollars nowadays for a, for a decent one. And 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 it is, I, I can see Kathy talking there, it's criminalizing childhood. It is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the chat's <laughs> going wild. So we I, know, I, have this, I, right. <laughs> I have this funny picture of, um, it's a church, a little church, beautiful church in Scotland. And it has huge amounts of land just, and it's mowed perfectly, this land. And it's this big, 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 big field with nothing in it except a little church in the middle. And on each side of the church, on the three sides that don't have the door on it, there are signs that say, not no ball games, but just no games. <laughs> so I'm kind of like, I've got pictures of this, but I'm like, so, so what I really want to do, and I've not had the courage to do it yet, but I'm actually thinking about just sitting down on the lawn one day and playing chess and see what happens. Because I'm just like, what do you mean, no Absolutely. games? <laughs> it's just like, bizarre. So I can tell you, you that Heather, Amanda, Kathy are all, are all prepared to give up to one pound for your criminal defense each. So so we <laughs> highly recommend that you go and do this and, and, and we'll definitely be there for you. Nicole, you've seen this too in the inner cities of America and elsewhere. You know, we're not creating space for people to play. Isn't it just as, as simple as that? Oh, absolutely. I, I saw it in the affordable housing world and you still see it in really all aspects. And it's about human sense design. And human-centered design can take on a whole variety of, of nuances. And, but at the end of the day, we know with our children, success breeds confidence. We know with humans, success breeds confidence. So let's give them a way to inspire those successful moments. And, and that's what, that what you're seeing, especially in the urban cities and your, where your high density of underserved communities are. That, that's where you're able to really deliver these programs that teach kids to be brave. By the way of a lemonade day stand, and that's just the beginning. That is just the idea is just to plant the seed, to let kids know that through social engagement, they can be brave. They learn how to teach, how to work with customers, all the way from dealing with angry customers to having to price your product so that you make, you make money on it so that you can buy yourself something and give back to charity. That's a critical part of our, of our program is teaching the social, the social impact as well for our kiddos. 
but we're teaching them to be brave. We're teaching them that it's okay to have these cool creative ideas and test them out every year. And then maybe one day it's going to see something bigger and better. We've got some of our kids that have gone on to Shark Tank. Some of our kids have their own business venture that all started with the Lemonade Day Stand. Some of them, my favorite is novelties that are lemon and lime themed or just other varieties of ways. So when you really get out and above just the just the yellow, it's not just the yellow, it's not just the lemons. It's about laying that foundation and letting kids be brave, teaching them a little bit about self-efficacy and how to be their own agent so that they can be braver in other areas of life. And that, and that is really a perfect segue to the next theme uh, about crossing boundaries. And that is to say, you know, we're, we're planning to bring Lemonade Day to Africa. Um, and, and some people might know that we've just announced the uh, founding of the Games for Change Africa chapter, which we're very, very proud to be curating. Um, and we're going around chatting to people in South Africa, in Kenya and elsewhere. And they say, but it's Lemonade Day. You know, that's very American. And I'm saying it's not about the lemons. It, you know, there's no barrier to entry here. For, for, for a couple of dollars less, you can get six lemons and some fizzy water and you're kind of on your way to setting up a lemonade stand. And we've seen firsthand the fact that, you know, they, they literally – the poorest kids with a little bit of imagination, maybe I hope some help with the program. That's nice, you know, to have, and we can obviously deliver that very cost effectively at scale. But, but really, it's just about seizing the imagination. What I really love is when kids for the first time, and you say, "Okay, so I, so I took a couple of bucks, and I and I managed to, you know, turn that into a, 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 some more money. And are you telling me I get to keep the money that I make?" And we're like, yep, that's the whole point. But all we want you to do before you do that is spend some, save some, and share some. And we're like, that's a universal truth. And, and, and for me, that's the power of Lemonade Day. That's the power of the games, Stephen, that you're working on. And, and why are these things so universally attractive? And do we need to – how do we get the balance right, I guess, between being culturally specific – but yet appealing to these fundamental human truths. Yeah, and I, I think Bron, uh, a wonderful educator and co colleague of mine, um, has uh, asked, kids have organically run lemonade stalls for years. Um, you know, what's the added value of formalizing this into a program? Which I think is a reasonable question, but I think it, it actually fits with what you've just suggested, um, is, is the idea that so, for example, I'm currently involved in a number of financial programs now with Minecraft, um, where we are able yes. to teach children about well, one of them, um, which we came up with in 2013, is called Blockonomics. And it's helping students to use Minecraft to look at things like debit, credit, taxation, affordable housing, non-affordable housing, employment, interest. You know, I'm going to give you five diamonds so that you can go do this. When you give me that back, I want six back. And we can also do things like in that world, um, I, I always pay the girls in my class less by one diamond. So boys who have a certain job in this class, they get five and the girls get four. And I wait for that trigger point. I, I, I do it on purpose because I'm a huge advocate of gender equality. And I wait for of that course. trigger point. And it, it comes in two forms. It's either a boy who goes, ha ha, you get less than me. Or a girl who's like, hang on a minute, why is he getting less than me? And that's our teachable moment. That's when we bring it all in and say, right, there is a problem in our world. It looks like this you are part of a generation that won't stand for it. And we and we move them out, uh, you know, into a, into a new sort of um, zone of thinking about that. And uh, to answer Bron's question, setting up a lemonade stand, and I don't, you know, the, the, the program sounds wonderful to me, but I'm not, I haven't done it or, or, or been involved with it. But I know that coming from the Minecraft side of things with the financial stuff is that it's not explicit. You might set up a lemonade stand and then you might just, keep the money and buy yourself whatever you wanted that week and your parents are super happy and and the little community that you were in is it loves it because they all but what it's the bigger picture it's what what is this teaching us as a skill base and this is what we're trying to do with things like blockonomics is where again it's relevance how is this relevant to the human being that i will become post my childhood where you know later what does this do for me and and that you know how do we look at charitable giving? How do we look at investment? What do I need to keep in order to be able to do this again um, next year? And so I, I, and I think that's one of the critical points, um, Glenn, is that 
what we're trying to do, particularly with technology and like Minecraft, is it's not about today and it's not about the, the lesson we did this week. It's way beyond that. We're talking about building humans for tomorrow, better humans for tomorrow. And significantly, oh, as Nicole said, exactly. in in areas where it just doesn't um it just doesn't happen, you know, that we talked about that generational thing earlier. You know, some parents yeah. don't know how to teach their children to be, you know, have manners or manage their money properly because they never did. In fact, they're in debt. Um, or their money goes on things like drink and 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 and, and drugs, maybe, or 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 they're just trying to keep the lights on. They're just trying to keep food in the fridge and they can't exactly. manage their so so if they can't do that themselves, how can they teach that themselves? So it's about breaking that cycle so that this time, you know, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 50 years from now, the cycles have changed. The cycles have maybe even um, reset absolutely spot on spot on and nicole do you also want to comment on bron's question there around why why do we need a program i, I think steven's done a brilliant job but yeah anything jumping out at you on that again i'm just going to keep calling steven into meetings with me uh, honestly because he just did such a beautiful job <laughs> of, of explaining really the difference that's assuming we can get him out of bail nicole <laughs> Once exactly. He, once he's been arrested, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. And, and I and I appreciate the question because it's a question even I had uh, when I was when I was looking to join the team. But at the heart of it is what Stephen said. It is putting learning how to put a business plan together and work that business plan and what it means for a child, especially our underserved communities who can't just go to mom and dad to help them put a lemonade they stand on, right? That's that's number one. Um, but we have to assume yeah. that there's a, a lot more kiddos out there that wanna do it whose parents don't have the means to. So we're teaching them how to not only write a business plan, an effective business plan, and then teaching about the financial literacy components, but you're also teaching them how to get out and be creative around seeking investment opportunities, around branding opportunities, around geography, learning location and the importance of location of setting up a business venture and, and putting all of those kind of workforce development and financial literacy tools together all in one. And like Steven said, it's much more beyond just putting a lemonade day stand together, but is what does it mean to be a real entrepreneur and put a smart business plan together that meets market market conditions and gets these kids excited about what other type business ventures they can set up using that base plan, using that knowledge around financial literacy and business development and being able to apply that in different areas of their life. Spot on. And I love what Nikki said in the comment section there as well. And it resonates powerfully with what you've both been saying as well. You know, there's no explicit testing um, in my Lemonade Day in the app. We don't layer a whole lot of content out there and then test people's uh, kids' recall on that. What we do is we simply unlock that intrinsic motivation that they have within them. We let them do stuff and then we simply reflect back to them what it is that they've learned. And Stephen, it's it's the same point that you were making. So I think that's really great. We've we've got a few minutes, five minutes to go. Um, I'm not seeing any specific questions in the Q&A section coming up, but I, I'm seeing some stuff pop up in there. Is there anyone who wanted to ask another question specifically? I've got one other theme I just wanted to catch up, touch on. Um, and that was really so yeah we'll we'll just keep going then but yeah if you want if you guys want to um, uh, start a, a conversation please do and of course uh, this is just the start of it we're all all ways available to carry on this conversation so so we've spoken about crossing cultures we've spoken about crossing the divide between digital and real world we've spoken about a lot of uh, crossing the divide between explicit and implicit so i'm loving loving all of those themes but how do we really start to change the world? And and in, I, I believe that in order to do that, we really do need new models for commerciality. We need to get to the point where corporates understand that this isn't just about making a donation and hoping somehow miraculously that the problem's gonna go away. We need to help charities run more like businesses. We need to find the so-called third way. Um, uh, uh, Stephen, you're, you're at the forefront of that thinking as well. You're, you're working with the, one of the biggest, in fact, the biggest company out there. Um, any trends, any thoughts that you have in how do we cross 
across this boundary and find new models to truly scale the impact of what we know works? So um, this might seem a little off piste um, as an answer, but it's the way I think about these things is we actually need to start breaking down what we assume to be our normal social financial structures. And I know this sounds like government rebellion, but but we do on a global, like, like I'll give you an example. It is, I find it astounding that the internet is not free in first, certainly first world developing countries like the United States or United Kingdom. I find it astounding that schools have to take millions of pounds of their budget to fund infrastructure when there's a tax system that should do that for, like it just, it just and, and I found out recently that there's actually one, one third sector group that, that have exemption and they get their internet for free. And I'm just like, I find that astounding. Um, that that our that our base infrastructure like the like Wi-Fi and is not free for schools. Maybe not necessarily at home, although South Korea is proving that that works. But but at least in schools. And so we have to start breaking those systems down. And and the pandemic has actually done that with things like do we or don't we have like go into the classroom or work from. I mean, I've worked from home now for eighteen months, um, and and haven't stepped foot in an office or seen another human being in in person. So, do we break? You know, how do we break those social systems? But the other thing is, and and the example I talked to you originally about, Glenn, was the the, the school in South Africa, the little classroom in South Africa that we built. The other thing we need to do is we need to stop overthinking and and over engineering the solutions to what could ultimately be simpler problems and and by that what i mean is i was challenged in in africa to see if we could um build a school in a, in a significantly poor area of the country where there were no schools and my my challenge was to the people was if, could we build a school with a 3d printer just one 3d printer one copy of minecraft on a laptop and uh, uh, and that was it. Well, some internet. And we did. We managed it. It didn't cost us 170 million and it didn't take, you know, 17 months of of of, of extensive building. Uh, what we did was we taught the children how to play Minecraft. They built toys inside Minecraft on a scale. We exported and then 3D printed those toys and then we sold them throughout Africa on this taxi network. And then with the money, we that we earned the rand that we earned we bought bricks and with the bricks we built a school um and it's still standing today i mean it's a it's effectively a classroom with like you know, and people donated glass and people donated a door somebody donated a door and somebody else donated 300 books but 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 it was one 3d printer which cost 250 bucks one laptop which was you know borrowed and and some internet and and i think what we have to start doing is rethinking the the structures and the infrastructures within which we currently exist rebel like break them down start again you know i remember and i'll finish on this point because i know we're coming up against time but i remember somebody said to me when i first visited seattle and the traffic was awful and it was like a three hours to get from the airport and into into redmond and people said to me i said this is awful how do you live with this and they were like oh you'll never change it you'll never ever ever change seattle traffic and then COVID hit and the roads were silent, so much so that they stopped doing traffic reports on the news. They were just like, well, there is no traffic, so we'll just stop doing traffic reports. <laughs> it's not that the traffic couldn't go away, it's that we didn't think it could go away. We had no imagination for how we might live in a traffic-free society until the pandemic. And shame on us, shame on us that it took a pandemic to do that. And so I think going forward, we need to start, it's not about you know, what's happening in our classrooms on a daily basis. It's the bigger picture. How do we break down the processes and the structures within which keep us in this in this linear, our assessment systems? Let's, let's rethink our assessment systems. And I'll stop there because I could keep going. Exactly. Yeah, 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 exactly. Systemic problems need systemic change. Um, and, and I hear you loud and clear. If you think internet costs a lot in the Western world, you should come to Africa. Nicole, some closing thoughts from you, your big thoughts for where you want to go with Lemonade Day. Um, yeah, tell us, tell us how we're going to change the world. Big vision. I, I really, I want to Lemonade Day to be the internationally recognized program for delivering experiential and entrepreneurship programs to kids. 
And at the end of the day, I want to get in front of as many children as we can to inspire them to be their own business owners one day. We, we all should remember that our economies, for the most part, are founded on the backs of small businesses. And, and what the revenue that small businesses bring to the global economy is, is grand. And we need to make sure that we are fostering that with our children and that we are delivering through these experiential programs and innovative tools through our technology world that we're getting in front of kids in a positive way and shaping their futures so that they can become their own business owners in the future. So I hope one day, just, 14 years, we've served a million kids. The next time you hear from me, I hope I'm coming to you saying that we've served a million kids a year. A million kids a year. I like it. Let's do it. I wanted to say that on our panel today, who would have joined us is Lucy Hoffman from the most incredible organization called Carry First, who've just opened up a platform to distribute games into Africa. Unfortunately, her mom um, is not well. And, uh, you know, I'm sure that you join me in wishing Lucy well. Um, I did want to thank Nicole uh, for coming onto the panel six weeks into the new job, sharing the vision, and, and, and for Stephen for sharing the wisdom and Stephen, I, I think everybody in the chat and, and elsewhere would just want to hear you continue to just talk about these things, the passion, the conviction, the knowledge that you have, the simplicity with which you convey your message is a true inspiration to us. Um, and just from uh, my side, let me just say that, you know, one way that you can make sense of all of this is that we all have this huge need to believe to belong and to behave in a way that is different, that makes us feel connected to people. We need to believe that tomorrow is gonna to be better than today. We need to belong so that we can find people around the world that, that resonate with our same core belief systems. And we need to behave in a way that is respectful towards each other, to respectful towards the, the, uh, the planet. Um, and we know that that games can do that. Lemonade Day, uh, Minecraft, the work that we're doing is important work now more so than ever. Um, and I will finish on that note and say the contact details in the chat. Um, come visit us at the Games for Change Africa booth uh, in the expo section. Thank you for your time. Um, and yeah, continue to enjoy the festival and let's go out there and change the world together. Thank you so much to everybody. Have a good Thank day. Thank you so Thanks much, Stephen and Glenn. Bye.